I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I spend a lot of time at the beach, honestly. Oh. <laughs> For example, like I think one of the pieces of advice that Steve Jobs actually gave is to be ready to say no a lot. The kind of cases that I handle are the kind of cases that most attorneys typically shy away from. Why? Because of the amount of work that's involved. If I love the client and I feel that justice is on their side, there's nothing I won't do for that client. Okay, let's talk about money for a little bit. Did making a ton of money make you happy? The thing I'll tell you about money is that money brings you comfort, but by itself, it doesn't bring you happiness. What type of sacrifices would you give to be at this more content, peaceful place? My philosophy now is that I'm going to do what makes me happy and let the chips fall where they may as far as financially goes. You must feel a little bit vulnerable. I don't mind feeling vulnerable. In life, we make decisions in our 20s and our 30s that we don't realize the repercussions until like 5, 10, 15 years down the line. I went to Loyola back to see all these kids that are graduating and they're all talking about I want to live in the fancy place, I want to have the fancy car, so I'm going to take this miserable job. And it's just backwards thinking. Sometime in 2019, I bought our dream house. The crazy thing is, is that after I moved into the house, I had actually never been more sad. I read you a little bit wrong. It sounds like you have more of a genuine love for the actual skills around trial advocacy. What is it? I think the complexity of it. A lot of times people have clients where they know the truth is on their side, but they don't have the willpower to see it all all the way through. You know, I've always loved that aspect of it. I've loved the fact that like, you know, if someone wants to test you, that they can test you and you'll you'll show them what's up. I have this philosophy on like if, if someone has negative energy or whatever, like they just become invisible to me. I'm kind of like in a permanent meditative mind state where like honestly like a a bomb could go off in front of me oh and I'll just God. be sitting here smiling. How could I not spend the next like five hours just probing you on how to get I mean like that's like what we're all looking for. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a peaceful person. The thing about me is that I'm kind of like living an experiment. <laughs> law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Welcome to Law Flip. It's a conversation about law, life, all things that we as lawyers have to deal with, money, what does it mean? What doesn't it mean? I'm Benji Smith. So today's guest is a legend as a lawyer, as a person. He helped build one of the powerhouse personal injury firms that we all looked up to. Um, and he's now starting his own firm or he has started his own firm. He's not your standard lawyer. Look at him. I mean, look at this guy. <laughs> he's beautiful. So he's got a lot of knowledge and value to give. I'm super excited to get him on the show. I've been meaning to have him on for a long time. We finally made it work. Welcome to Rafael Javit, also known as RJ. Welcome, RJ. Hey, what's up, Benji? Okay, so we got a new phone number. It's one eight three three Law Flip. If you have any questions whatsoever, any legal questions whatsoever, hit us up. So please go to youtube.com slash lawflip and lawflip.com to sign up to be the first to get notified for giveaways, deals, and announcements. Let's flip the game upside down. How are you, RJ? I'm really good. Thank you, you look amazing. This is <laughs> Thank like you. you've always been chill but I feel like this is the most content or at peace that I've seen you at. What do you you know, I, I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I spend a lot of time at the beach, honestly. Oh. <laughs> what, do we, what do we do at the beach? I go there like three, four times a week. I walk oh my from God, my house. That's amazing. Yeah. So you've been through a lot of change the past few years. You came out of law school. You basically went straight to personal injury, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people, uh, you know, we've had on the show do personal injury. And I think just to explain to the audience, one of the reasons that a lot of people find it appealing is you get to help people, you don't have to charge hourly, and you basically, your clients get paid when you get paid, so it's a pretty cool way to earn a living, right? That's So when I first got out of law school, I started my own practice, mm -hmm. and I was doing everything. Mm -hmm. I was doing like a personal injury, I was doing medical malpractice, I was doing employment, I was doing contractual work, I was doing hourly work. Um, and after a few years, I just focused on personal injury. I realized that if you're going to do, you know, something, you should do one thing and just do it well. Oh my God. That's something that I, I could, I had such a hard time saying no for like the first 10 years of practice. Cause there's like a desperation almost that you fall into because you're just like, I don't want to lose this opportunity. I don't want to lose this opportunity. 
and like the power of no and saying, no, I don't want to do this for me has been super liberating. Is that kind of what you were thinking? I think that's like a lesson that you learn later in life mm -hmm. is that it's very important what you choose to do and what not to do and not to get bogged down in things that are not worthwhile. Mm. Um, so yeah, for, for example, like I think one of the pieces of advice that Steve Jobs actually gave is to, you know, be ready to say no a lot. Yeah. And he, he focused on a few amazing products, made them incredible. And so you basically did personal injury and then you started this powerhouse law firm BD and J and you guys built it up and you really were like the eye of sort of a lot of us in Los Angeles. You built up this incredible firm. Um, maybe you could tell us about just the, um, just the rise and how, how it felt along the way. So after three, four years of practicing on my own, I partnered up with my best friends since like, you know, since we were teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of had a very interesting dynamic. Um, you know, they are very business savvy yeah. and I'm very practice savvy. Yeah. Um, and together it was a combination that kind of just took off from the start and mm -hmm. was, was very successful. Yeah. And so you guys built this amazing thing, um, had huge verdicts, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of settlements and verdicts. And then uh, the past few years has been sort of a transition and now you've started your own firm. What are you excited about with your new firm? So my new firm is a completely different animal than what I was doing before. Um, it's no longer like a huge practice. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm only representing a handful of clients like you know, right now I have about 14, 15 clients and at my peak, I don't want to have more than 40 or 50, quite frankly. And what are you focusing on? I'm focusing on personal injury, catastrophic accidents. Um, but the kind of cases that I handle are the kind of cases that most attorneys typically shy away from. Why? Because of the amount of work that's involved, because of the amount of the investment that's involved, because it's, you know, there are uphill battles. You just talked about before about choosing things that you really want to focus on why would you focus on after all these years why would you focus on the most challenging type of cases maybe this is the time in your practice where you'd want to like sort of just keep it simple stupid you know i've always handled the most like complex cases my entire career um and that's what i find gratifying um i find cases gratifying where you know you you know it's going to go to trial for example. Just to give everybody in the audience a, a sort of an idea, most attorneys run away from cases that are going to trial or they try to do everything they can to settle the case before it goes to trial. Like 99.9% .9 of cases settle. Correct. Correct. So, and you, you have felt comfortable just taking those on without worry whether it's going to trial or not. I actually prefer those cases like where you have um, defendants like the County of Los Angeles or huge companies where they have a policy of not settling and they want to go all the way. Um, I'm very selective about the cases that I pick. I, you know, I want my number one requirement is that I have to love the client. Mm. And if I love the client and I feel that justice is on their side, there's nothing I won't do for that client. Okay. Let's talk about money for a little bit, because I think that's such a big part of, uh, the journey of a lawyer. First, first of all, people, people have a misconception that they think that all lawyers make a ton of money. Um, and then lawyers, I think, get into it because they think they're going to make a ton of money. And then a lot of their decisions are driven by it. You did objectively, incredibly well financially and otherwise along your career. Did making a ton of money make you happy? The thing I'll tell you about money is that money brings you comfort, mm -hmm. but by itself, it doesn't bring you happiness. And that you have to have general fulfillment in your everyday life to be happy. Probably most people think that money will bring you comfort and not necessarily happiness. But did your views about money change over the years? You know, my career involved like the first half of my career was actually litigating and trying cases. Mm -hmm. And then the second half of my career, because the office had grown so big, um, involved more managing. Mm -hmm. and not actually directly representing clients, not going to court anymore, but managing attorneys and managing complex cases. And what I can tell you is that, you know, obviously the second half of my career when the office was bigger and, 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 and badder was, you know, financially more lucrative. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, 
I was happier when I was actually doing my skill set. Just to give people the context, when you say bigger and better, like how many, well, at the peak, how many employees did you guys have? I think when I left, we were about at 130. Yeah. I mean, that's like a, that's a major, that's a major enterprise. So now that we see you as the more peaceful, more content RJ, what would you sacrifice? Is there a monetary sacrifice you would give up or is there any, what type of sacrifices would you give to be at this more content peaceful place. My philosophy now is that I'm going to do what makes me happy and let the chips fall where they may as far as financially goes. You truly, you're truly living that. Correct. How do you think you got to that place? You know, being in a partnership is like being in a marriage. Yeah. And you kind of form a group identity. Mm -hmm. And then when you kind of get off on your own and you do your own thing, you kind of find your identity again. So you're going through this transition. I mean, you're still in it. You're still just a few years in this transition. What is it like? What is it like leaving that group identity and sort of coming out on your own? You're, you're this well-established person. You have this, the credentials, you have the skills, you have the experience, you have the reputation, but what is it like? You must feel a little bit vulnerable. I don't mind feeling vulnerable. Um, I'm one of those people that's very comfortable throwing themselves into, you know, different situations and just working my way through it. Have you always been like that? Yeah, I don't fear change. I actually embrace it. That's a big one for lawyers because I think lawyers basically get stuck in these positions. I was just talking about how this kid that I grew up with is one of the smartest kids I know. He called me this last weekend and was like, dude, I'm just miserable. And I'm like thinking to myself, how is this guy, how is this guy having a hard time like basically figuring out a path for himself. And it's because I think we're trained as lawyers to have these old school thoughts. So like maybe you can give a little bit of advice on how to look at things different. The first thing I have to say is that I've been, I've, I've had a very fortunate career and I was fortunate to be partners with my best friends. And, you know, my best friends were also very capable attorneys. Um, and businessmen. And so I kind of have the luxury of, you know, working two decades in that field and being able to exit and kind of do what I want now. That's a good point. Like it's very easy or it's a lot easier for people who have done well and sort of come from a place of sort of privilege to be like, okay, change is easy. Exactly. Exactly. But if you had the, if you were able to See, I just, I, I think that's true to an extent. I still think that we make choices out of like perceived obligation back when we were younger. Like we have to do this, we're supposed to do this. But like, if you really think about it, we didn't have to do it. So I wonder what advice would you give yourself or for anybody in their career struggling? Like, do you have a choice? Do you have to go down a miserable path where you're operating in a place where you hate your job every day? I think that in life, we make decisions in our 20s and our 30s, for example, that we don't realize the repercussions until like 5, 10, 15 years down the line. And when you realize, you know, maybe this is not something like we're all we're constantly evolving. Yeah. You know, who I am today is a lot different than who I was five years ago, who I was 10 years ago. But you're kind of stuck with the decisions that you made five, 10 years ago. Right. So to those people that are kind of stuck in their own decisions, I would advise them to take a step back, try to find themselves, try to figure out exactly what makes them happy. And if they have the potential to follow their dreams, then to do it. Yeah. I think that when you're, you know, because you, 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 you've done litigation, you do litigation when you're litigating, it is so all consuming that I think it's so hard to take a step back and say like, what do I really want to do? And then you get into the trap of, okay, I got a paycheck, I got a mortgage, I got kids, I got family. Um, and so I just think that we, we create these artificial traps for ourselves. And then we're like, wait, but we don't even like what we're doing, but we have to keep it rolling. So I just, yeah, I just want to encourage more and more people to take that step back and really consider there is a different way to operate. Um, you have a house that you're like supporting, but like, what if you just maybe, maybe you sell your house, maybe you sell your house or maybe you don't. I went to Loyola back to see all these kids that are graduating and they're all talking about, 
I want to live in the fancy place. I want to have the fancy car. So I'm going to take this miserable job. And it's just backwards thinking. I don't know. So the one thing I can tell you is that um, sometime in 2019, I bought our dream house mm -hmm. um, for me and my wife. I saw it. This thing is a banger. Um, and it's not like the nicest house, but yeah, it's just it like a, <laughs> it's a beautiful property. <laughs> yeah. And it's just wonderful. It's been good for the quarantine because like, you know, sure. we spend a lot of time there. And the crazy thing is, is that after I moved into the house, I had actually never been more sad. Mm. And the reason why was because I bought this huge house and I was like, okay, now I got to pay for this house and I got to make X amount of dollars to keep the house and I want to keep the house and it's going to be so hard to keep the house and yada, yada, yada. And then after I sold, I was like, you know what, it doesn't make sense to keep this house after like, you know, I'm, st I'm starting a new career again. Even after you left your old firm? After I left my old firm, I was like, it doesn't make sense to keep this house. Um, and I had kind of resigned the fact that I was going to sell it. And when I, when I accepted that I was going to sell the house, surprisingly is when I started enjoying the house. Wow. Um, so that kind of taught me a big lesson about your environment. Mm. And it's not a really, it's not necessarily well, it's your mindset. I mean, like it's, it's more about your perspective. The house is the same. It's the same house. Yeah. Um, it's more about your perspective. Yeah. So what have you done in the past? Cause, uh, you left your firm in 2019. It's August, 2020. What do you think you've been doing to change your mindset around the house, around other things? Well, the first thing I did after I sold is I took a sabbatical for about four months. I know I hit you up and I was like, I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It was some business opportunity or something. You're like, dude, I'm, I'm just chilling right now. <laughs> yeah. I was like, really? Okay. That's amazing. So you did that. You did the sabbatical. So I, so I did my bucket list during uh -huh. my sabbatical. What like, was the bucket list? Just going back to the things that I love. Like I used to be a skater and Shocking. I went to Venice beach and I skated the skate parks. This is amazing. Um, I've always wanted to play, to play pickup basketball during the day. So I went yeah. to like Venice beach and played with the ballers on, uh -huh. on, on the courts. And I went to wooden center during the day and just would hang out at UCLA. Wow. I have a painting I've been working on for like five years. Um, so I, you know, spent a good amount of time working on that. And I also spent time uh, re-educating myself on trial adv advocacy. I saw, I saw some Instagram posts where you were like, I thought you were like taking the bar again. You were, I, I saw you were writing on, you know, legal yellow pads. It makes me so happy. You have no idea. What's going on there? Like what, what, what makes you happy about it? It goes back to my roots. Like yesterday I was putting together, um, a cause of action for a complaint and I was mm -hmm. going through all the KC jury instructions and I had the same legal pad and I, I wrote down like, you know, 50 potential cause of action that I have to go back and research and cross reference and with the facts and all that. And, you know, the actual practice of law makes me happy. I honestly, I had you read, I read you a little bit wrong. I assumed that you were just an extremely business savvy, a uh, personal injury attorney that like happened to throw up the, you know, I, I you know, I do trials and I do, I, I actually do the trial work. I did not realize that you truly had a passion for that aspect of it. And there's no shade to people who run their firms like business. Cause I believe in that too, very much. Um, and it's not to say that you're not going to do that as well as a trial attorney, but like you, it sounds like you have more of a genuine love for the actual skills around trial advocacy. What is it? I think the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. I think that ultimately it comes down to the truth mm -hmm. and, and it comes down to willpower. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people have clients where they know the truth is on their side, but they don't have the willpower to see it all the way through. Right. Um, and, you know, I've always loved that aspect of it. I've loved the fact that like, you know, if someone wants to test you, that they can test you and you'll, you'll show them what's up. One of the things that we talk about all the time is how actual trial work, actual litigation, the, one of the most brutal parts is the, it's not the adversarial nature, cause that's okay. It's the toxicity that comes with some people opposing counsel in these battles that we have. So maybe you could tell us like a, What's your experience in the battles and what's your mindset around dealing with the battles? I think the biggest difficulty that most litigators and trial attorneys have is not necessarily the opposing counsel. It's their case. Mm. Um, 
you know, if you have a, a righteous case where you love your client, no matter how adversarial the other side is, you have a certain passion for the case. And, you know, you just, you'll do everything possible to advocate for your client and win the case. Um, if you're litigating cases that you don't like, then that's what takes a toll on you because mm. you're like, you're like, what am I doing here? You're just, you're, you're basically, you're selling yourself. You're soul like, you're like sense. a clog in the machine. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So like I have this, you know, philosophy on like if someone has negative energy or whatever, like they've just become invisible to me. And this, how does that actually look Okay, practically? Cause you know, I don't have it, but like, if I did have it, what do I, what do you do? You just shine me call. You just, just like, you don't talk to me. It's just, I, I don't process what they're saying. Uh, you know what I mean? What do you do if they're like people that are close to you, friends, family? That's more difficult. You create um, healthy boundaries. I do. What's, I've, what's I've a become healthy boundary? Like less calls, less, less hanging out. Exactly. Yeah. That's something that's really hard to establish in your life that I think I have figured out, you know, just in the past few years. And there is, it's, it goes back to saying no. It goes back to being able to say no to doing things that you just don't believe in or that you don't think make sense for you. I think when it comes to your personal life or your friends, or your family, it's harder to do. But when you do it, it seems like everything gets better. Is there anything else that you do to create this peaceful environment that you're in? You know, my whole life is like a constant meditation. And is that the past few years or is that always? I've always been in a, like, like that, but since I sold my practice mm -hmm. and I've gone out on my own and I have like, I'm dealing with less emails and less phone calls. I was getting like four or 500 emails a day. Yeah. God knows how many phone calls I would pick up because you know, you never know if it's a potential client right. or whatever. And the first thing that I did after I sold was I slowed down my heartbeat because my heartbeat for the past two decades was just beating so fast every single day, every single day. And like, I'd come home at the end of the day, I'd calm myself down. And like, you know, the next day would be the exact same thing. Um, so I'm definitely, once I sold, I kind of had a, a conscious decision to slow down my heartbeat. And like, I'm kind of like in a permanent meditative mind state where like, yeah. honestly, like a, a bomb could go off in front of me oh and I'll just God. be sitting here smiling. Like, how could I not spend the next like five hours just probing you on how to get, I mean, like, <laughs> that's like what we're all looking for. <laughs> so what, what are you actually doing? Like, you know, TM transcendental meditation. Like, are you actually doing meditation? No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a peaceful person. Uh -huh. Like, you know, I'll spend hours at my house just looking at a tree. Like, you know, <laughs> remember that, that, that tree I showed you the, 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 the big one, like yeah. it's, you know, it's, I have this beautiful tree on my property and like, it's, it's so large that it's like when the roots touch the ground, it's kind of like God touching the ground. It's like so impressive. It's amazing. And I swear I'll just sit there and listen to music, which is huge for me, Yeah. which is a big part of my life. What kind of music are we talking? I'm very eclectic. Mm -hmm. um, I love hip hop, obviously, yeah. but I love everything. Like recently I've, I've gotten into French hip hop, mm. um, but I listen to everything. Okay, create a create a playlist, and we'll 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 put a link to it in our in our bio. I would love to. Okay, so you've also been sending out these like positive vibe uh, Facebook posts, right? Like, kind of like Gary V, Tony Robbins, but very short form. And I'm curious your thought process behind doing that, behind uh, like your feelings on what if any negative energy you've received back from that and how you've dealt with it. I think the reason I started sending out those posts is because I like, I, I posted some random thing that was related to the pandemic mm -hmm. and I got like a hundreds and hundreds of messages, um, some positive, some negative, And it was just like a, it was just like a war going on. And I just, I wasn't interested in that. And you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice that one of my mentors taught me recently, which kind of changed my life is to trust your instincts. And, you know, now I'm kind of like one of those people that has Tourette syndrome that like, you know, if they feel something and they, they have to, they want to say it, they just say it. Mm. And for me, like, I just wanted to send out positive energy out there, 
you know, kind of like, and, 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 you know, see what happens. What's been your experience? Like with, with these positive messages you've been putting I mean, out? a lot of people have told me that they, um, they connect with it, that they enjoy it. Um, some people have even ridiculed me for it, but I don't care. Mm. You know, I, I'm just going to do whatever I do. And, you know, I think what's interesting about you and, you know, if you hear people say they're in a peaceful trans or, you know, meditative state all the time or that, you know, they look, stare at a tree for a couple hours. I think that, you know, maybe maybe this is a bad thing. Like, I think we only give credit to those ideas when they come from somebody who's successful. Like if you just talk to some random dude on the street who said that. I would be, maybe be a little bit, huh? Eh, yeah, there's a reason why you're saying that you stare at a tree for a couple hours. Why is it so hard for us to like just appreciate being in that state, um, sort of like operating like that, just as like irrespective of what you're doing as a career? You know, people expect too much to be happy. Mm. You know, it's for me, it's the simple things in life that make me happy. Like nothing makes me happier than laughing with my friends. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing makes me happier than spending time with my family. Nothing makes me happier than being able to sit down peacefully and not be interrupted. Nothing mm. makes me happier than going for a three hour walk. Nothing makes me happier than listening to hip hop. Um, and these are like very simple things. Yeah. You don't you don't need a huge amount of money or success to have that. Um, but I think people think that, oh, I have to like, they have these like, you know, goalposts that I have to reach X, Y, or Z before I'm happy. And either they don't reach that goalpost or they do. And they realize that they're still not happy. And I think one of the interesting things that we've talked about is this perception that if you do things to make you happy, that means that you're sacrificing a financial stake when in my experience, it hasn't been that way. I, I, like that, that when you do things and you're putting out value and you're living a way that you feel good about, you're, you're going to be rewarded. Even if that's not your goal, even if you're willing to make the sacrifice. The thing about me is that I'm kind of like living an experiment. <laughs> so I'm not sitting here saying I have all the answers. Sure, sure, sure. Neither. And I'm definitely not, you know, I just like the conversation. But what I can tell you is that, yeah, I mean, you know, my philosophy is going to be just, you know, doing whatever makes me happy and seeing where the chips fall, where they may. And sure. hopefully, you know, I, I've seen enough people in, in this world do that before and be successful. And hopefully I'll be one of them. But if I'm not, that's fine, too. Yeah. OK. All right. We are going to move to deal of the week. RJ, my deal of the week this week, it's Motion LA. What is Motion LA? Motion LA is this workout thing that I started. It's an entrepreneurial workout. Every Sunday we do it at different locations. We did it at UCLA. We did it at the beach. It's kind of crazy. A guy like me, who's not in great shape to start a workout thing. But I was like, I have this like Greek God, Sasha, who's like 24 years old. He's like this incredible looking beast. And I'm like, Hey, let's, we always want to start something together. I met him in this weird way. We're like, let's start this thing. So we start it. There's like seven of us. Then there's 15 of us. There's 25 of us. Now, like every single Sunday, there's like 40 to 60 people showing up at these things. People are making best friends. People are just having these great workouts. We introduce ourselves at the end. We connect people. Big deals have happened out of it. That is my deal of the week. Hit me up if you want to know more. RJ, what's your deal of the week? My deal of the week is probably to remind people um, that are successful to mentor mm. people that are on the rise. I love this one. I've mentored so many people. And, you know, now that I've started this new chapter in my life, I've really, you know, connected with my a mentor that I have. And it's really done a lot for me. And like people always say, oh, when you're a mentor, you get more out of it than the person. But like, I actually believe that. Like, is that your experience? It's a win-win. Yeah. Um, you know, number one, like if nothing feels better than helping someone. For first, sure. First of all. Um, and then second of all, like, you know, I've mentored so many people that were quote unquote competitors of mine mm -hmm. in the PI game. And now that I'm on my own, they're referring me a lot of cases. Sure. And they're the same ones that are giving back to me. Totally. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a selfish benefit to mentoring mm -hmm. and there's also like, you know, just an objective good feeling to it. For sure. Okay. Legal tip of the week. 
This is brought to you by Smith & Benowitz. It's a personal injury employment and class action law firm. Okay, so my legal tip of the week. It is money makes people act funny. <laughs> you know that, RJ? It does. So you ever heard the phrase, I'll take care of you? So like a lot of times, you know, in business and in, 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 in the legal world and business, you're really hesitant to put something on paper because like, oh, dude, we're beyond that. We don't need something on paper. And I hate to like, I'm kind of speaking out of both sides of my mouth because I'm saying like, you know, just do the right thing. But on the other hand, I'm saying like, if you want or you expect to receive compensation for something, whether it's you're an employee, whether you're making a business deal with a friend, I don't believe in the I'll take care of it always because money makes people act funny. And so I would just say, if you don't expect something, don't document it. If you expect something, document it. RJ, what's your legal tip of the week? My legal tip of the week is to have a healthy fear of driving on freeways. Mm. The craziest things that you could never imagine happen on freeways. Talk to me. Um, like from, you know, tires coming off cars and impaling you <laughs> to, you know, driving in the rain and your car spinning out for no reason. Mm -hmm. So be very vigilant when you drive on the freeway. And if you can, try to avoid it. That is an Excellent one. <laughs> I, I seen some crazy shit on the freeway. RJ, we've learned a lot. This is must see TV for any lawyer or really person in business to watch. I got so much out of it. You've always been an inspiration to me. I really appreciate you taking the time. If you can, let us know where people can find you, where they can send business your way, either uh, social media, where they can get some of your positive thoughts. Um, so give us your social media, your email, and then any parting words for the law flip audience. I'm, uh, you know, it's not hard to find me, especially in this day and age. Um, I have a website that's coming up and I have, you know, marketing materials that's coming out, but honestly, like I'm not, I'm not even in a rush to, for those to come out. Um, I love you. So if you need to find me, it's not that hard. <laughs> He won't even plug himself. <laughs> I love you. Okay, then you got to give some some parting words that summarize this beautiful conversation that we've had. Okay. Um, parting words are treat others like you want to be treated yourself. Beautiful. I love it. RJ, thank you so much. Thank you. This is amazing. There we go. We will see you next week, Law Flip. Just, just take this in. Law Flip, Law Flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Okay, so Arian, they're asking where they could find us. So for law flip, it's at law flip and lawflip.com. For Smith & Benowitz, our law firm, which does personal injury employment and class actions, you could find us at at Smith Benowitz and smithbenowitz.com. For the personal stuff, like where you're really going to find the juicy stuff, at Benji Smith and benjismith.com at WagesGuru and LewisBenowitz.com for Lewis. Oh, so Lawflip is produced, directed, and edited by the young legend Aryan Tabibian. Visual effects and compositions by another young legend, Oren Azad. Intro music provided by Pen Practice. Pen Practice, what is it? Premium instrumentals for upcoming artists by the music industry's top producers. For more info, visit penpracticemusic.com. I had so much fun recording the intro song with my man Hilton Deuce Wright. Looking forward to hearing more and more from Pen Practice. So the Law Flip identity, this hot logo that you're looking at, created by Garrett Whiston and Travis Nagel. Special thank you to Shy and Seth from the Horwitz Marketing Agency. And lastly, a huge thank you to our beautiful wives, Julie and Lisa, for supporting our vision and all the love to all of our four boys combined. Disclaimer, this podcast is made available by Smith & Benowitz for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is only intended to provide general information and opinions about legal and other concepts and is not intended to be used as a source of legal advice or relied on for legal advice. By listening to this podcast, you understand that no attorney-client relationship is being formed between you and Smith & Benowitz or any of its attorneys. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state.